communication. One can lack any of the qualities of an organizer with one exception and still be effective and successful. That, exce uh, that exception is the art of communication. It does not matter what you know about anything if you cannot communicate it to your people. In that event, you are not even a failure. You're just not there. Communication with others takes place when they understand what you're trying to get across to them. If they don't understand, then you're not communicating, regardless of words, pictures, or of anything else. People only understand things in terms of their experience, which means that you must get within their experience. Further communication is a two-way process. If you try to get your ideas across to others without paying attention to what they have to say to you, you can forget about the whole thing. I know that I've communicated with the other party when their, li their eyes light up and they respond, I know exactly what you mean. I had something just like that happen to me once. Let me, let me tell you about it. Then I know there has been communication. Recently, I flew from O'Hare Airport in Chicago to New York. After, uh, after the jet pulled away, the gate we heard the familiar announcement. This is your captain speaking. I'm sorry to advise you that we are number 18 for takeoff. I'm turning off the no smoking sign and we'll keep you posted. Many a captain feels compelled to keep you entertained with an incessant stream of verbal garbage. You'll be interested to know that this plane fully loaded weighs blah, blah, blah tons. Y you couldn't care less. Or... Our flight plan will carry us over Bozicus, Ohio, and then Junk Spot, etc., etc. However, on this trip, the captain of the plane touched on the experience of many of the passengers and really communicated. In the midst of his entertainment, he commented, Incidentally, I will let you know when we get the takeoff clearance, and from the instant you hear those jets roar for the takeoff until the instant of liftoff, we will have consumed enough fuel for you to drive an automobile from Chicago to New York and back with deto detours as well. You could hear such comments as, oh, come on, he must be kidding. With the announcement of clearance and takeoff a run, passengers all over the plane were looking at their watches. At the end of the approximately 25 seconds to liftoff, passengers were turning to each other saying, would you believe it? It was evidence that, as you might expect, many passengers had been concerned at some time with the number of miles a car could tra uh, travel on a given amount of gas. Educators are in common agreement on this concept of communication, even though few teachers use it. But after all, there are only a few real teachers in that profession. An educational leader makes this point of understanding and experience in a very personal way. Quote, When he has had experiences of life, read Homer and Horace by all means, says Newman, feed mind and eye and ear with their images and language and music. But do not expect to understand what they are really talking about before you are 40. The truth was first brought home to me more than 30 years ago one December day as I walked down the road from Argentarius to Shimon after a, a snowfall. And suddenly from the abyss of a conscious memory, a line of Virgil rose into my mind and I found myself repeating, Sed asiet egrebus nivels informus et alto, terra galu. I had read the words at school and no doubt translated them glibly. The earth lies formless under snowdrifts and deep frost. But suddenly, with the snow scene before my eyes, I perceived for the first time what Virgil meant by the epithet informis, without form, and how perfectly it describes the work of snow, which literally does make the world formless, blurring the sharp outline of roofs and eaves, of pines and rocks and mountain ridges, taking from them their definite shape and form. Yet how many times before that day had I read the words without seeing what they really meant? It is not that the word informus meant nothing to me when I was an undergraduate, but it meant much less than its full meaning. Personal experience was necessary to real understanding. This is Sir Richard Livingston on Education, published in 1945, page 13. Every now and then, I've, accu I've been accused of being crude and vulgar because I've used analogies of sex or the toilet. I do not do this because I want to shock, particularly, but 
because there are certain experiences common to all. And sex and the toilet are two of them. Furthermore, everyone is interested in those two. Which can't be said of every other common experience. I remember explaining relativity and morals by telling the following story. A question is put to three women, one American, one British, and one French. What would they do if they found themselves shipwrecked on a desert island with six sex-hungry men? The American woman said she would try and hide and build a raft at night or send up smoke signals in order to escape. The British woman said she would pick the strongest man and shack up with him so that he could protect her from the others. The French woman looked up quizzically and said, What's the problem? Since people understand only in terms of their own experience, an organizer must have at least a cursory familiarity with their experience. It not only serves communication, but it strengthens the personal identification of the organizer with the others and facilitates further communication. For example, in one community, there was a Greek Orthodox priest who will be called here uh, the, Ar <laughs> the Archimandite uh, Anastopoulos. Every Saturday, uh, Saturday night, faithfully followed by six of his church members, he would tour the local taverns. After some hours of imbibing, he would suddenly stiffen and become so drunk that he was paralyzed. At this point, his faithful six, like pallbearers, would carry him through the streets back to the safety of his church. Over the years, it became part of the community's experience. In fact, a living legend. In talking to anyone in that neighborhood, you could not communicate the fact that something was out of place, not with it, except to say it was out like the Archimandrite. The response would be laughter, nodding of heads. Uh, yeah, we, we know what you mean. But also an intimacy of sharing a common experience. When you're trying to communicate and can't find the point in the experience of the other party at which they can receive and understand, then you must create the experience for them. I was trying to explain to two staff organizers in training how their problems in their community arose because they had gone outside the experience of their people. That when you go outside anyone's experience, not only do you not communicate, you cause confusion. They had earnest, intelligent expressions on their faces, and they were verbally and visually agreeing and understanding, but I knew they really didn't understand and that I was not communicating. I had not got into their experience, so I had to give them an experience. We were having lunch in a restaurant at the time. I called their attention to the lunchroom menu listing eight items of co or combinations in all numbers. Item number one was bacon and eggs, potatoes, toast, and coffee. Item number two, something else. And item number six was chicken liver omelet. I explained that the waiter was conditioned in terms of his experience to immediately translate any order into its accompanying number. He would listen to the words bacon and eggs, etc. in his mind, but his mind had already clicked number one. The only variation was whether the eggs were to be done easy or the bacon very crisp, in which case he would call out number one easy or a variation thereof. With this clear, I said, now, when the waiter takes any order, instead of my saying a chicken liver omelet, which to him is number six, I will go outside his area of experience and say, you see this chicken liver omelet? He'll respond, yes, number six. I'll say, well, just a minute. I don't want the chicken livers in the omelet. I want the omelet with the chicken livers on the side. Now, is that clear? He'll say it is. And then the odds are nine to one. Everything is going to get screwed up because he just can't order number six anymore. I don't know what will happen, but I will have gone outside his accepted area of experience. The waiter took my order precisely as, I've been descri as I described above. In about 20 minutes, he returned with an omelet and a full order of chicken livers, as well as a bill for $3.25, $1.75 for the omelet and $1.50 for the chicken livers. I objected and immediately took issue pointing out uh, all I wanted was number six, the total price of which was $1.50, but that instead of having the livers mixed in with the omelet, I had just wanted them on the side. 
Now there was a full omelet, a full order of chicken livers, and a bill for nearly three times the menu price. Furthermore, I could not eat a full order of chicken livers as well as the omelet. Confusion came down. Waiter and the manager huddled. Finally, the waiter returned, flushed and upset. Sorry about the mistake. Everybody got mixed up. Eat whatever you want. The bill was changed back to the original price for number six. In a similar situation in Los Angeles, four staff members and I were talking in front of the Biltmore Hotel when I demonstrated the same point, saying, look, I'm holding a $10 bill in my hand. I propose to walk around the Biltmore Hotel, a total of four blocks, I love this example, and try to give it away. This will certainly be outside of everyone's experience. You four walk behind me and watch the faces of the people I'll approach. I'm going to go up to them and uh, go up to them holding out this $10 bill and say, here, take this. My guess is that everyone will back off, look confused, insulted, or fearful, and want to uh, get away from this nut fast. From their experience, when someone approaches them, he's either out to ask for instructions or to panhandle, particularly the way I'm dressed, no coat or tie. I walked around trying to give the $10 bill away. The reactions were all within the experiences of the people. About three of them, seeing the $10 bill, spoke first, I'm sorry, I don't have any change. Others hurried past saying, I'm sorry, I don't have any money on me right now, as though I'd been trying to get money from them instead of trying to give them money. One young woman flared up almost screaming, I'm not that kind of girl, and if you don't get away from here, I'll call a cop. Another woman in her 30s snarled, I don't come that cheap. Then there was one man who stopped and said, what kind of con game is this? And then walked away. Most of the people responded with shock, confusion, and silence. And they quickened their pace and sort of walked around me. After approximately 14 people, I found myself back at the front entrance of the Biltmore Hotel, still holding my $10 bill. My four companions had then a clearer understanding of the concept that people react strictly on the basis of their own experience. For another example of the same principle, here is a Christian civilization where most people have gone to church and have mouthed various Christian doctrines, and yet this is not really a part of their experience because they haven't lived it. Their church experience has been purely a ritualistic decoration. The New York Times some years ago reported the case of a man who converted to Catholicism at around the age of 40 and then filled with the zeal of a convert, determined to emulate as far as possible the life of St. Francis of Assisi. He withdrew his life savings, about $2,300. He took the money out in $5 bills. Armed with his bundle of $5 bills, he went down to the poorest section of New York City, the Bowery. This was before the time of urban renewal. And every time a needy-looking man or woman passed by him, he would step up and say, please take this. Now, the difference between this situation and mine around the Biltmore Hotel is that the panhandlers on the Bowery would not find an offer of money or of a bowl of uh, soup outside their experience. At any rate, our friend attempting to live a Christian life and emulate St. Francis found that he could do so for only 40 minutes before being arrested by a so-called Christian police officer, driven to Bellevue Hospital by a so-called Christian ambulance driver, and pronounced non copos mentis by a so-called Christian psychiatrist. Christianity is beyond the experience of a Christian professing but not practicing population. In mass organization, you can't go outside of people's actual experience. I've been asked, for example, why I never talk to a Catholic priest or a Protestant minister or a rabbi in terms of the Judeo-Christian ethic or the Ten Commandments or the Sermon on the Mount. I've never talked in those terms. Instead, I approach them on the basis of their own self-interest, the welfare of their church, even its physical property. If I approach them in a moralistic way, it would be outside their experience because Christianity and Judeo-Christianity are outside of the experience of organized religion. 
they would just listen to me and very sympathetically tell me how noble I was. And the moment I walked out, they'd call their secretaries in and say, if that screwball ever shows up again, tell them I'm out. Communication for persuasion, as in negotiation, is more than entering the area of another person's experience. It's getting a fix on their main value or goal and holding your course on that target. You don't communicate with anyone purely on the rational facts or ethics of an issue. The episode uh, between Moses and God, where the, uh, when the Jews had begun to worship the golden calf, is revealing. Moses did not try to communicate with God in terms of mercy or justice when God was angry and wanted to destroy uh, the, uh, the Jews. He moved in on a top value and outmaneuvered God. It's only when the other party is concerned or feels threatened that they will listen. In the, area of, in the arena of action, a threat or a crisis becomes almost a precondition to communication. A great organizer like Moses never loses his cool as a lesser man might have done when God said, Go thee down, thy people, whom thou, uh, thou hast brought out of the land of Egypt hath sinned. At that point, if Moses had dropped his cool in any way, one w would have expected him to reply, where do you get off with all that stuff about my people whom I brought out of the land of Egypt? I was just taking a walk through the desert and who started that bush burning? And who told me to get, the, uh, get over to Egypt? And who told me to get those people out of slavery? And who pulled all the power plays and all the plagues? And who split the Red Sea? And who put out a pillar of clouds up in the sky? And now all of a sudden they become my people. But Moses kept his cool. And he knew that the most important center of the, his attack would have to be on what he judged to be jo uh, God's prime value. As Moses read it, it was what that God wanted to be number one. All through the Old Testament, one bumps into, there shall be no other gods before me. Thou shalt not worship false gods. I am a jealous and vindictive God. Thou shalt not use the Lord's name in vain. And so it goes on and on and on and on, including the first part of the Ten Commandments. Knowing this, Moses took off, his, uh, 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 took off on his attack. He began arguing and telling God to cool it. At this point, trying to figure out Moses' motivation, one would wonder whether it was because he was loyal to his own people or he felt sorry for them or whether he just didn't want the job of breeding a whole new people because after all, he was pushing 120 and that's asking a lot. At any rate, he began to negotiate saying, look, God, you're God. You're holding all the cards. Whatever you want to do, you can do and nobody can stop you. But you know, God, you just can't scratch that deal you've got with these people. I mean, you remember the covenant in which you promised them not uh, not only to take them out of slavery, but they would uh, they would be uh, be practically inherit the earth. Yeah, I, I know you're going to tell me that they broke their end of it and all, but so all bets are off. But it isn't that easy. You're in a spot. The news of this deal has leaked out all over the joint. The Egyptians, the Philistines, the Canaanites, everyone knows about it. But as I said before, you're God. Go ahead, knock them off. What do, you, what do you care if people are going to say? You know, there goes God. You just can't believe anything he tells you. Can't make a deal with him. His word isn't even worth the stone it's written on. But after all, you're God, and I suppose you can handle it. And the Lord was appeased from doing the evil which he had spoken against his people. Another maxim in effective communication is that people have to make their own decisions. It isn't just that Moses couldn't tell God what God should do. No organizer can tell a community either what to do. Much of, this, um, much of the time, though, the organizer will have a pretty good idea of what the community should be doing. But they'll want to suggest, maneuver, and persuade the community towards that action. He'll never want to tell the community what to do. Instead, use loaded questions. For example, in a meeting on tactics where the organizer is convinced that tactic Z is the thing to do, organizer. What do you think we should do now? Community leader number one. I think we should do tactic X. Organizer, what do you think? Leader number two. Leader number two. Yeah, that sounds pretty good to me. Organizer, what about you, number three? Number three. Well, I don't know. It sounds good, but something worries me. What do you think, organizer? Well, the important thing is that you guys think. What's something that worries you? Leader number three. I, I don't know. It's something. Organizer. Organizer. 
I got a hunch that I, I don't know, but I remember yesterday you and number one talking and explaining uh, to me something about somebody who once tried something like Tactic X and it left him open wa- uh, wide open because of this and that. So it didn't work or something. Remember telling me about that number one? Leader number one who's been listening and now knows Tactic X won't work. Sure. Yeah, sure. I remember. Yeah. Well, well, we all know X won't work. Yeah. So we also know that unless we put out all the things that won't work, we'll never get to the one that will, right? Leader number one. Absolutely. And so the guided questioning goes on without anyone losing face or being left out of the decision-making, every weakness of every proposed tactic is probed by questions. Eventually, someone suggests tactic Z, and again, through questions, its positive features emerge, and it's decided on. Is this manipulation? Certainly. Just as a teacher manipulates, and no less even Socrates. As time goes on and the education proceeds, the leadership becomes increasingly sophisticated. The organizer recedes from the local circle of decision makers. Their response to questions about what they think becomes a non-directive counter question. What do you think? Their job becomes one of weaning the group away from any dependency on them. Then the organizer's job is done. While the organizer proceeds on the basis of questions, the community leaders always regard their judgment above their own. They believe that he knows his job or they know the right tactics and why should oh that's why the, he's the organizer the organizer knows that even though they feel that way consciously if the organizer starts issuing orders and explaining it would begin to build up a subconscious resentment a feeling that the organizer is putting them down and not respecting their dignity as individuals the organizer knows that it's a human characteristic that someone who asks for help and gets it reacts not only with gratitude, but with a subconscious hostility towards the one who helped. It's a sort of psychic original sin because they feel that the one who helped them is always aware if it hadn't been for their help, they would still be a defeated nothing. All of this involves a skillful and sensitive role playing on the part of the organizer. In the beginning, the organizer is the general. They know where, what, and how, but never wears the four stars, never is addressed, nor acts as a general. They are an organizer. There are times, too plenty of them, where the organizer discovers in the course of discussions, like the one above, that that tactic Z or whatever it was they decided on ahead of time is not the appropriate tactic. At this point, let's hope their ego is strong enough to allow someone else to have the answer. One of the factors that changes what you can and can't communicate is relationships. There are sensitive areas that one does not touch until there is a strong personal relationship based on common involvement. Otherwise, the uh, uh, the other party turns off and literally does not hear, regardless of whether your words are within their experience. Conversely, if you have a good relationship, and they are very receptive, your message comes through in a positive context. For example, I've always believed that birth control and abortion are personal rights to be exercised by the individual. If in my early days when I organized the back of the yards, Chicago and New York, which was 95% Roman Catholic, I had tried to communicate this even through the experience of the residents whose economic plight was aggravated by large families, that would have been the end of my relationship with the community. That instant, I would have been stamped as an enemy of the church and all communication would have ceased. Some years later, after establishing solid relationships, I was free uh, uh, <clears throat> sorry. I was free to talk about anything, including birth control. I remember discussing it with the then Catholic Chancellor. By then, the argument was no longer limited to such questions as how much longer do you think the Catholic Church can hang on to this archaic notion and still survive? I remember seeing five priests in the waiting room who wanted to see the chancellor and knowing his contempt for each one of them. I said, look, I'll prove to you that you do really believe in birth control, even though you're making all kinds of noises against it. And then I opened the door and said, take a look out there. Can you look at them and tell me you oppose birth control? He cracked up and said, that's an unfair argument and you know it. 
but the subject and nature of the discussion would have been unthinkable without that solid relationship. A classic example of the failure to communicate because the organizer has gone completely outside the experience of the people is the attempt by campus activists to indicate to the poor the bankruptcy of their prevailing values. Take my word for it. If you get a good job in a split-level ranch house out in the suburbs, a color TV, two cars, and money in the bank, that just won't bring you happiness. The response, without exception, is always, yeah, let me be the judge of that one. I'll let you know after I get it. Communication on a general basis without being fractured into the specifics of experience becomes rhetoric, and it carries a very limited meaning. It is the difference between being informed of the death of a quarter of a million people, which becomes a statistic, or the death of one or two close friends or loved ones or members of one's family. In the latter, it becomes the full emotional impact of the finality of tragedy. In trying to explain what the personal relationship means, I have told various audiences, if the chairman of this meeting had opened up by saying, I am shocked and sorry to have to report to you that we have, been just, oh, we have just been notified that Mr. Olinsky has just been killed in a plane crash and therefore this lecture is canceled. The only reaction you would, have, uh, you would have had would be is, well, gee, that's too bad. I wonder what he was like. Or, well, let's see. What are we going to do this evening? We've got the evening free now. We, should, we could go to a movie. And that is... And that is all that one would expect. Oh, Jesus. And that is what all one would expect, except of those who have known me in the past, regardless of what the relationship is. No. Uh, quote, Now, suppose after finishing this lecture, let us assume that all of you have disagreed with everything I have said. You don't like my face. You don't like the sound of my voice, my manner, my clothes. You just don't like me, period. Let us all further assume that I am to lecture you again next week, and at that time you are informed of my sudden death. Your reaction will be very different, regardless of your dislike. You'll react with shock. You'll say, why just yesterday he was alive and breathing, talking and laughing? It just seems incredible to believe that suddenly like that he's gone. This is the human reaction to a personal relationship. What is of particular importance here, however, is the fact that you're dealing with one specific person and not a general mass. It is what is implicit in the reputed statement of that organizational genius, Samuel Adams, at the time when he was allegedly planning the Boston Massacre. He was quoted as saying that there ought to be no less than three or four killed so that we will have martyrs for the revolution but there must be no more than 10 because after you get beyond that number, we no longer have martyrs, but simply a sewage problem. This is the problem in trying to communicate on the issue of the H bomb. It's too big. It involves too many casualties. It's beyond the experience of people and they just react with, yeah, it's a terrible thing, but it really doesn't grip them. It's the same thing with figures. The moment one gets into the area of $25 million and above, let alone a billion, the listener is completely out of touch, no longer really interested, because the figures have gone above his experiences and are almost meaningless. Millions of Americans don't know how many million dollars make up a billion. This element of the specific that must be small enough to grasp by, uh, be grasped by the hands of experience ties very definitively into the whole scene of issues. Issues must be able to be communicated. It is essential that we, uh, they cannot be communicated. It is essential that they be simple enough to be grasped as rallying or battle cries. They cannot be generalities like sin or immorality or the good work or life or morals they must be this immorality or this slumlord with this slum tenant where these people suffer. It should be obvious by now that communication occurs concretely by means of one specific experience. 
General theories become meaningful only when one has absorbed and understood the specific, specific constituents and then related them back to the general concept. Unless this is done, the specifics become nothing more than a string of interesting anecdotes. That is the world as it is in communication. <laughs>